Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Chess Down Under. Today we'll be taking a look at a really fascinating, attacking, ferocious game of chess that Garry Kasparov played all the way back in 1977. This was actually a training match that he played in Baku, so it doesn't appear in all databases. It's a bit of a hidden gem. So let's get straight into it because I'm dying to show you how this game unfolds. Gary is playing with the black pieces and his opponent starts with knight f3, knight f6 from Gary, d4, e6, c4, and d5. So we have a queen's gambit declined here with the pawns on e6 and d5. Knight c3 from white and Gary plays classically with bishop to e7. Bishop to g5 from white, h6, asking the question to the bishop what its intentions are. The bishop drops back to h4, castles, e3, and b6. So we have gone through the opening stage relatively quickly, as I wanted to focus most of the energy on the middle game, where the fireworks really blow up. This pawn move here, b6, is what is known as the Tartakoa variation in the Queen's Gambit declined. Black's idea is very simple. He'd like to move his bishop to b7. If allowed, he will take the pawn on c4, opening up the light squares, and he'll reign supreme on that diagonal. It is a very effective plan, and it is quite popular at the top level and at club level as well. In this position, white plays a fairly rare move in queen to b3. The bishop developing moves, such as bishop to e2 and bishop to d3, are more common. So we have a fairly rare and unique position now, with the queen coming out to b3 nice and early. Bishop to b7, developing. And now we see an exchange of bishop for knight. And Gary retakes. I'll just quickly go back here. I know that a lot of club players might be scratching their head at that type of move. You might know that the bishop pair is very strong and was favoured by players such as Kasparov and Bobby Fischer. We've seen countless games of the bishop pair really dominating opponents. So why does White in this situation, seemingly unprovoked, exchange his bishop for that knight? Well, it's quite concrete, actually. If White, for example, were to play some sort of quiet move, like bishop to e2, Black has a very easy equalizing approach here, and it's something that you need to have in your back pocket if you're going to be playing the Queen's Gambit declined. And that simple approach is we jump into e4 with our knight. We have opened up an attack against the bishop. Let's say the bishop exchanges. We take back. And now white might be licking his lips thinking, I'm going to be winning a pawn here because have a look at this. I've got more attackers than you have defenders, and I'm winning the game. But after white captures this central pawn, we don't retake here. We first take the knight, white would recapture, and now we take with the bishop. And this position here is incredibly solid. C5 is coming very quickly, almost regardless of, of what white does. Black will have easy development for his knight and the rooks as well. And it just turns out that these types of structures are very, very difficult slash impossible for, for white to really play for anything. So that is why in these positions, if we go back to this move here, it is quite common for the white side to just give away that dark squared bishop for that knight to avoid this approach of just mass liquidation of the minor pieces. So we see bishop f6, Gary retakes. And now white takes on d5, looking to keep a black pawn stuck there on d5, which limits the scope of the bishop on b7. Black would have really liked to capture that pawn on c4 himself, which would have opened up that like squared bishop. Rook to d1. Now this is a very common move in these types of structures. Black's idea is very simple in these structures. He really wants to liberate his position with c5. The idea of rook to d1 is that white is anticipating c5 coming up, and his idea is that when black plays c5, I'm going to take that pawn 
and now my rook is gloriously placed on the d-file. That is why in the queen's gambit declined, in setups where you're not playing the minority attack on the queen side, it is very common for the rook to come to the d file in anticipation of a c5 break. So this move, rook to d1, was engineered to say to black, hey, I know you'd like to play c5, but this rook move that I made, rook to d1, is really saying to you, don't do it, don't play c5, because if you do, I'm going to have a huge amount of activity. Just don't do it, don't play c5. So what does Gary do? Of course, he plays c5. Now this is incredible. When I first saw this game, I was like, okay, how, how is this possible? So White is probably scratching his head here. He takes that pawn, and on the surface of things, this looks absolutely glorious for White. You can't retake the pawn here because your bishop would be left hanging there. The queen would just simply pick up the bishop and Black would be lost. So you can't retake that pawn. You're under massive pressure here in the center of the board against d5. So what is Gary's plan here? How, how can he get away with this? What's his follow-up to c5? He plays the very calm knight to d7, which is just unbelievable, I guess, just giving away further material for the sake of speeding up his development. Now, in the game, white played c6, which turns out to be the best move for white. But if we go back to this position here, you might be scratching your head and thinking, well, I can take this and I can take this. Shouldn't that just be great for white? Let's have a look actually what happens if white tries to take that pawn with his knight. We don't take the knight. No, we first take on c5 with our knight. We're now hitting the queen on b3. And you might think to yourself, well, we just jumped in picked up a pawn, and now we're also going to pick up your bishop as well. Shouldn't this be just absolutely glorious for white? That is what would happen. The queen would retake. But now have a look at the issues that white is facing. His queen is under attack. And remember that bishop, that Tartakoa variation bishop on b7. Hello. What is happening here? We've got lots of pressure there. We've got lots of pressure here. It turns out that there's quite a few, I guess, concrete problems. And now let's say, for example, that white plays a very natural looking move, like queen to c2. We can bring our rook around, lining it up against the queen with all sorts of crazy threats here. Let's say the queen drops back to b1. We now kick the queen all the way to the corner of the board. Have a look at that. Is that the worst queen you've ever seen in your life? Now we take here on f3. White would recapture. We take f3 with the queen, hitting the rook in the corner. The rook would need to move. We jump into e4 with our knight, threatening checkmate here. Let's say white tries to defend that laterally with his rook. We now slide into c2, and this is just unbelievable. Have a look at the evaluation here. Minus 38.7. Have you ever seen an eval that bad? It's basically like the entire material set that you start off with, that's what you're down by. Minus 38. Unbelievable. So, yeah, we can conclude that this is completely unplayable. So it just goes to show, with a few inaccuracies and some very natural-looking moves, taking that central pawn, the white position can just very quickly collapse. Okay, if taking the central pawn with the knight looks a bit dangerous, well, what happens if we go in here? Now, the same issue comes up. We don't take that pawn back. We jump in with our knight again to c5, hitting the queen. And this is quite similar to the last variation, but actually it's quite worse for white because in the previous variation, at least he was able to snap off the bishop. In this particular line, he doesn't even get to do that. So let's say the queen goes back to c2. We drop back to d6. Now with all sorts of crazy threats now, I absolutely love this variation. Have a look at what happens here. Let's say white takes the extra pawn on a7, getting very greedy. We play d4, sacrificing that pawn to absolutely obliterate the center 
and open up all sorts of lines. Once that file opens, our rooks will get active, our bishop has suddenly come to life. Have a look at how things could play out. If white were to take that pawn, we bring our rook to e8. Danger, danger. Look at what's happening here. Let's say white tries to quickly scurry out of the way and castle as soon as possible. We jump into f4 with pressure here, pressure here as well. We've got massive pressure down the e-file. White might think, hey, I got out just in time. Thank you. I'm castled and, and I'm safe. No, you're not. You're not safe. You are completely busted, mate. Have a look at this quiet but absolutely ridiculously strong queen to c8. And the threats are real. Black has a very simple and deadly threat here. Notice that there's an x-ray against the white queen, which is undefended. Black here is threatening to pick up that bishop and white would not be able to recapture it because he'd lose his queen. So let's say, for example, white tries to defend the bishop by sliding his rook to d2. So now he has the bishop and the queen both guarded at the same time. Looks great, right? No, have a look at this. We take on g2. Unbelievable, just sacrificing. And this bishop on b7, that Tartakoa variation bishop, is just an absolute beast. If white takes that knight, we come into g4 with the queen, the king goes back to the corner, and we are absolutely crushing here on the light squares. And what is defending the light squares for white? It's that light squared bishop. So we simply snap it off the board and we completely crush. This is checkmate. So some unreal variations here of what could have happened if white were to take any of those pawns back in this position here. So taking that central pawn on d5 or continuing to gobble up on the queen side. So both of these look absolutely incredibly dangerous for white. So instead he plays c6, forking the two black pieces. Gary is forced to recapture. Knight to d4, hitting our unprotected piece here. And so Gary snaps that knight off the board. We have a recapture with the rook and knight to c5 now, attacking the white queen. The queen drops back to d1. So now all sorts of pressure piling up on d5. And now I love this moment here. Have a look at this. The knight drops back to e6, kicking the rook back to d2. And now have a look at this. I know that a lot of club players will be absolutely dropping their jaw with what they see here. Pawn to d4. He simply gives away the pawn. This is the absolute Gary Kasparov style where he showed the world that you can sacrifice material for initiative. He's not even looking to immediately capture anything back for his sacrificed pawn. He's looking to open up lines against that king and to get the initiative of the game. White takes the pawn and Gary moves his rook out to e8. Again, lining it up against the white king. And on the surface of things, you might not really sense the danger of, of white's position here. You, you might think that, hey, I'll just get my bishop out, I'll castle and I'll be fine and I'll have an extra pawn and everything will be great. Well. It turns out it's actually not that simple to do. Look at the power of this bishop here. If you try to develop, say bringing your bishop out to e2 or d3, or you're leaving g2 hanging, there's also discovered checks coming in the way as well. It turns out that it's actually quite a difficult problem to solve, practically speaking. Let's just show like what could potentially happen. Let's say bishop to e2, that seemingly natural looking move. We simply take on g2, and if the rook comes out to g1, look at this. We jump into f4 with our knight, and this is pretty much completely busted for, for white. His king is trapped, completely trapped in the middle of the board. Black can just pile up the pressure slowly and just start marching his army towards that white king, and white is completely paralyzed. So you can't be playing moves like bishop to e2 here. So, so what can you do? White tried to play f3 
His idea was that by playing f3, I've given myself this f2 square. So in the case of any kind of strange knight hops, I'm just going to scurry over to f2 with my king and kind of castle by hand slowly. Well, no you're not. Gary plays bishop takes f3. Unbelievable. Just snapping that pawn off the board. Now, the queen can't take that pawn because we'd move our knight to g5 with a discovered check and we'd pick up the queen. Let's just quickly show that. If white tries to take the pawn with the queen, check, and your queen is lost, oops a daisy, he can't take with the queen, so he takes with the pawn instead. But now have a look at what happens here. Anytime you move your f pawn, you open up this dangerous diagonal. It's something that you need to be constantly aware of. The queen comes in to h4, white slides his rook across to f2 to intercept, and now knight takes on d4 with discovered check. The bishop intercepts the check. And now have a look at this. I love this. This was so cute and, and funny to see. Knight takes on f3 with check. Have a look at this. That knight, visually, it looks like anything can take it. There is like so much pressure visually on that square. But everything is pinned. The rook is pinned this way. The bishop is pinned that way. So it looks visually like f3 is well guarded, but actually it's not. No, nothing can take that knight. The king moves to f1, and now the queen slides in with another check. White intercepts again, and now the rook is pinned here. So previously it was pinned there, now it's pinned on g2. That rook is having a really sad life at the moment, but it's about to get even sadder. The knight jumps into h4, we have now a lot of pressure on the rook. White guards it with rook to g1. Now Gary brings his final piece. The rook slides across to d8, hitting the queen. The queen shuffles across to d1. And now have a look at this. Unbelievable. This is pinned that way. The bishop is pinned against the queen. There are so many pins happening here. This whole game has just been pin after pin after pin. And now look at this. The rook comes in to d3 with all sorts of funny business coming in this way. The bishop is pinned, so white is pretty much completely paralyzed. There's hardly a single piece that he can move. He tries queen to f2, and now have a look at this unbelievable move right now from Kasparov. He plays knight to f3. What on earth is going on here? It is just unbelievable how tied up the white army is. Have a look at this. If white tries to take the rook, well, no, you can't do that because that's actually a checkmate. Have a look at this. We can take on h2. The rook can't capture because of the pin. And the king can't go anywhere because that file is completely taken by our rook. So you can't take the rook. Well, what happens if we try to take this guy here? Well, we just recapture and you've lost your queen. So that's no good as well. So this black knight has just jumped into f3. It seems visually that like pretty much anything can be taken here from black, but actually it turns out that that nothing can be taken. So what can white do here? He tries playing his rook back to h1, but now simply rook to e3, just piling up. This bishop is now absolutely terminally pinned now because if any time that bishop moves, we'd be sliding our rook into e1 with devastating effect. So is there any piece here from the white army that can even move? He tries just shuffling his rook back and forth. There's, there's nothing else that he can do. He can't even think of what to move. And now Gary just plays this really classy move, king to h8, making sure that there's no funny business happening here down the g-file. It frees up his queen to be able to move without worrying about any queen move suddenly unleashing the rook onto g7. So Gary just calmly making sure that his king is in good order before proceeding with his attack. It is a very classical and typical Kasparov-like move. White is just simply shuffling his rook back and forth. He's got nothing else to do. And have a look at this final move in the game, b5. 
and in this position why resigned because there's literally nothing he can do he's just going to be like shuffling his rook back and forth and the black army is just going to steamroll through once that knight gets dislodged from this c3 square then this bishop suddenly becomes loose and if that bishop is no longer protected well the white position just completely crashes as we mentioned before if that bishop tries to move anywhere, we're just crashing through onto e1. So in this position here, white resigned. What an absolutely incredible game. Completely tying down the entire white army with pin after pin after pin. Every single white piece in an open position like this. It's not like we had a closed position with limited squares to move. The game is completely open. There's no pawn in the center of the board. We have a completely open position and the entire white army in an open position is completely immobilized. Nothing can move. I just found this game absolutely fascinating. I've never seen anything like this for the entire white army to be completely immobilized with all sorts of pins in such an open position with so many pieces on the board. Absolutely incredible devastating attack from Kasparov here. Not worried about sacrificing material for initiative because, oh boy, if you give Kasparov initiative, he knows how to place his pieces to completely cripple the opponent's army. So there we have it. I hope everyone enjoyed that game as much as I did. And thanks for watching today's video.